It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. It's not good, Logan. It's not good at all. Commanders lose 24-10. Playoff hopes as we talk in the balance, completely reliant, of course, on Kirk Cousins. <laughs> that what The more things change, somehow they stay the same. The Commander's playoff hopes going into week 17 rely on Kirk Cousins to get a win. Uh, that didn't exactly always go great when he was here in Washington. We'll see what happens when the Vikings take on the Packers later. Uh, if you're listening to this on audio uh, tomorrow as we record this Sunday. Uh, so you're listening on Monday. Uh, we do not know currently as we record this, we decided we were going to go ahead and record anyway, despite not knowing the commander's full fate because Logan, there is plenty to talk about from this game itself. The long-term ramifications we will get into, but if we just focus on this game, the commanders are now 0-3-1 in their last four games. Uh, the decision to go back to Carson Wentz, one that I think both of us probably would have also made clearly does not look in this moment like the right one uh, it backfired in a major way offensively they were a disaster <laughs> defensively they wore down uh we still are waiting and we'll probably get a little bit of an update while we're recording here as ron rivera speaks to the media on john allen so that is also something to watch like all in all couldn't have been a much worse day for uh for the commanders as they lose to cleveland yeah, I mean, uh, just depends on which side of the ball you want to start on. So, you know, I think uh, let's start with the defense. Uh, you know, in talking with people around the building, I felt like they were prepping for something that didn't show up today. They were prepping for kind of the maturation of this Cleveland offense into this like quarterback keep, zone read, RPO thing. And instead of doing that, which made perfect sense based on the last four games, Cleveland did the smart thing and said, what is the best, best way to maximize our best offensive player? Let's get them back seven yards deep, toes at seven, attacking downhill. Let's do what we do best with like kind of our gap, pin pull type stuff. And, you know, you could tell that the commanders weren't really ready for that. And I was surprised by that too because they really hadn't shown, I don't want to say any of that, but very little of that over the last four weeks since Deshaun's taken the helm. So I think that kind of explains some of that run difficulty. Obviously, that's not excusing them. You need to make adjustments in game to get that done. You can tell that they were thinking uh, thinking Cleveland will come out with something completely different. Obviously, there was a couple coverage issues, you know, when you end up with um, uh, – they're two different plays. I know they kind of feel similar. The one to our, our, our Cooper um, late in the game, you know, Forrest is going to roll down with that. I'm trying to remember the first one kind of where Cooper – where um, not Cooper, where Forrest ends up kind of matched on um, Cooper in a man-to-man -man situation. Cooper, yeah. Again, that's where you kind of – Cam Curl adds a ton of value there. So I just felt like they came out and uh, Cleveland got them, you know, like on defense. Cleveland kind of said, we're going to do this stuff. You're not ready for it. And it's hard to say that with 100% certainty because how does this game look if the offense is a little bit better? You know, Cleveland yeah. probably loses a possession. The score might be a little bit different. Jack might Well, that possession they would have lost, game. they, they you know, Cleveland, Cleveland lost a possession when Washington held the ball for – what was basically the they entire did. second quarter. Yep. So there's that. But I mean, like the rest of the drives, I think are, I mean, look it up. I don't want to yeah, misquote myself it's, here, it's but they're all bad. three it's and outs or something three like outs. that. Three and out, six and out. Like it's just not, not a great offensive performance. And, you know, you mentioned uh, Carson and what, you know, that whole experiment. And it kind of felt like, you know, this was, this was a possible outcome for sure. I think, I think it was, I don't have any evidence for this, but as I was watching, I was like, this feels like someone's trying to prove something. Um, and I, I, it's hard to say who's trying to prove what, but that's kind of what it felt like, kind of this. Well, what do you what do you mean by that? Like, so Carson's trying to prove something. Scott's trying to prove something. Ron's trying saying. to prove something. It, it kind of like I don't I don't want to speak on it because I don't know for sure, and I'd like to talk to some people about this first. But it kind of mm -hmm. felt like they needed a definitive answer about yes or no on Carson. And they were just going to let that ride. I remember uh, it reminded me of a game um, when uh, when Jay was here where they were kind of trying to prove that Robert couldn't be the starter anymore. And they let him play. And he had a whole bunch of turnovers and the offense didn't look good. And then they were like, see, like he can't do it. We're at a point where he can't do it now. Let's go back to whatever we want to do. And so that, that that's kind of what that reminded me of. I'm not saying that's what happened here, but that's what that felt like and that's what that reminded me of right um of course the difference also, though is like that's that's got to be what the end of 2014 um that when was, that's yeah, happening 2014. yep mm -hmm. so that was like that is the right end of here. a lost season like this well, is it was, playoffs it, are on the line that was actually earlier in the season that was like week 
eight or something, week seven. Okay. It, was, it was earlier, you know what I mean? So, like, obviously, yeah, the dynamics here are are much, much different. Um, and I do think, you know, like we like we both said on the pregame show, we would have probably made the same decision. Um, the other thing that was a little um, frustrating for me was I felt like they kind of got – they just got away. No play action passes. And everyone's like, oh, what about that little token fake? To me, I don't count those. Those are like soft play action fakes. I want the same play action fakes you guys have been so successful with for the last eight weeks. Like, what happened to that whole thing? So that was really frustrating for me to kind of watch that and kind of wait for that. You're in a good situation to call a shot, but you're calling a drop back pass. And, you know, we talked about not putting too much on Carson. I just felt like they were like, Let's shovel it on his plate. I know they ran the ball semi-effectively, but in terms of your play action, in terms of your concept, right? Let's just talk about this for one second. So there are certain throws and certain reads that are easier for your quarterback. In a drop back passing situation, you have to make a pre-snap decision about which side of the field you're going to read, and then you have to read the side of the field once you get there. In play action pass, it's like this is where I, as the coordinator, have schemed this up for you throw the ball to this person. One of these two people It's very, very straightforward. We run a boot, right? We run a boot. It's like, there's a three level throw, get the ball out of your hands and let's let this thing rip. They did do some of that. Um, I feel like some of their execution on the boot stuff can be better. And that's more like just being from Kyle's system where they run a lot of boots and like you learn like the little tricks of the trade. But yeah, man, I just was super frustrated. Like, midway through the first half and then i had to kind of let it go because i was like this is who they are this is what they want to do this is what they want to be so you know who, who but, am i to like, tell them no at this point someone who has better ideas about what they could be offensively like frankly um i know that's harsh uh but they claim they want to be this power running team they have success when they are a power running team and then they come out six of the first seven plays in shotgun and I realize like Carson must like gun and to, I guess that's a personal preference, but like sometimes you just got to tell your guy like, Hey, you're a professional. You're fine from under center. Like we trust. And we don't, you. and we don't, We're gonna... and we just to be clear. We don't know whether that's his preference, whether that's Scott's preference. We just know that that's what they did in this game. Right. We just know that they came yeah. out in gun. More but than it's also had. what they did in the first six games. Like they, and they did it and they did it when he when and like when, when Scott wants to revert back, sorry to cut you off to like what he thinks this offense should be. It's the first half of the giants game. It's this gun run, gun setup offense, and I get it. It does have its advantages, but I think it also has its, its disadvantages. And for this team and this group, and real quick, shout out the offensive line. I thought they did a really good job today on the whole, considering what they were dealing with. But yeah, man, it was. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I was just super fired. No, up it's just that. like they're they're at their best when Brian Robinson is in the dot. And they run everything as if it's about to be a running play to Ryan, Brian Robinson. And th that threat is in the defense's mind. They're not as good off tackle. They're not as good on some of the, and the outside zone type of stuff. Like all of that is yeah. not where they're at their best. And their play action is not as good off of it. They don't get the boot stuff as well off of it. Like it's just, it's just brutal. Um, in terms of their up and down nature, um, I I don't I don't get what they're doing. Um, and the thing is, like, yeah. it'd be one thing if it was like we're searching for an answer. We don't know where they can actually be successful. You know, whatever. But they went on that run early or in the middle of the season with Heineke doing a very specific set of things, and then they just yeah. stopped. And and it's like, why do you? I I would genuinely like to know what it is that made them think that stopping doing that was the correct idea. Was it something defenses were doing? Was it a change in their personnel? Like what is the reason? Or is it just like, Oh, we thought we could be better this way when all the evidence suggests otherwise. And I'm not saying that whatever the reason they would say would be a good one, but it's very clear that they made some kind of conscious decision and between the offensive coordinator doing that and the head coach not stopping it, despite getting up at the podium every week and saying that, like, no, we're we're the other team, the one that was winning. Like, I that that to me is just like it's so bad. I don't I don't know really how to put it in context other than that, like, and and yeah. what that means moving forward and all that kind of stuff. It's just bad, man. It's just bad ball, and, and they look like a bad clear, football team again. And just to be clear for the listeners, like, you know, we're we're like pseudo fans of this team, and we want them to do well. So when we see performances like this it's really frustrating for us you know personally and professionally so this, this is a this is a tough deal for everybody 
<clears throat> it's a tough deal for the team, tough deal for the organization, the guys, all that kind of stuff, but also the media that covers it. Very, very challenging. And, you know, like even something like, uh, you know, the second interception, second interception, yeah, second interception to Curtis Samuel, right? Like I don't inherently dislike that concept. You've got your number three receiver matched up against a linebacker in cover two. Like you're, it's a bad coverage player versus a very good, fast, explosive player. That's a mismatch in favor of the offense. I like that. Good process. Excellent job. A couple of things here. If you are going to run Tampa 2, let's say the guy does stay over the top because that sometimes that does happen. I mean, he's playing that position from eight yards depth. Sometimes he stays over the top or sometimes the relationship's good. Why, why don't you have a route replacing where the little, where the Mike linebacker is? Why don't you have something that if they, their only answer to this is if he plays it like this, you have something that replaces that position. Even if it's a check down right over the ball, right there. Yeah. Give him the ball. I mean, let to, him kind of get to Scott's him. credit, Cam was open at, what was it? 12 yards, like more in a hook um, area he, than on the one that you're talking about the deep one to Samuel that gets picked. Um, yeah, yeah, on the uh, Tampa two beater. Yeah, like Sims is he's not directly over the ball, um, but like he's got like the frustrating thing about that one when you watch it back. I don't know what replays you're able to see because you're obviously it's yeah. first half, so you're still doing the show live. But like he's got Sims wide open for a first down. It just forces it. Yeah, and he forces it, and, and, and it's like, also like, but to your point, maybe if it's in that thing where okay, I'm reading the Tampa player. If he goes yes. deep. I throw underneath, it's an easier read for Carson and he doesn't make that mistake. Yeah. And then you could even say, like, well, what if what else can we do to make this easier for him? Why don't we coach it up so that when that Tampa player does get de depth, we have Curtis cross his face so he's in a window and there's an angle for the throw, as opposed to trying to lollipop it over coverage where you have no real idea of how far or close he is to you. So those are some things again that I just think could have been a little bit better. And again, it's, it's easy for me to say here, sitting right after the game, like I didn't have to do any game plan prep this week for this offense. But those seem like simple things that can get that done. Um, again, like forcing the football down the field when you don't have to. I felt like Carson was pressing a little bit, kind of maybe again yeah. him trying to prove a point. And uh, and those those types of things are are frustrating. They're frustrating to watch because they don't lead to good offense. And yeah, uh, and let's just know, let's just say what it is. Like Carson was bad. Like Carson Wentz yeah. was a really, really bad quarterback by NFL standards and really, frankly, by any standard um, today. And that's not a, necessarily a reflection of him overall, but it is kind of a reflection of who he's been in Washington this season. Yeah. And, you know, I think Colts fans would be like, hey, this is who he was last year. And Eagles fans might be like, hey, this is who he was the year before, which is why we traded him to to Indianapolis. And and I mean, he had some balls that he just like bounced into the ground. He had a check down late where he just throws it way over the top um yeah. of jonathan williams like there's just it, it's it's just bad process all around and then compounded by bad execution and there and that causes like other players to make mistakes like i don't think Jahan dotson's going to drop more than one more screen the rest of his career but like yeah. you're so out of rhythm you're so out of whack you get going on that one drive Jahan drops the screen you might score on that play because that's how screens work you time it right and instead he drops it yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the drive basically dies right there because you're on a second and 10 and what does Scott do right back to that useless gun run that goes nowhere with Jonathan Williams. And, and now you're in third and long and that basically is over. Um, it's just, it's just really bad ball all around. And, I, you know, Logan, there's, uh, some comments coming out from Ron Rivera that I think are interesting in his post game press conference Two two in particular one, he says that he did consider going back to Heineke. Um, but once the, Cleveland went up 14. He's like, oh, we're going to have to throw it. And, you know, at that point, you just stick with Carson. And I'm kind of like, if you think Heineke is the better quarterback down seven, why do you think he's not as good down 14? Like, Carson has had a terrible day throwing it. If you are considering making that switch, and look, at this point, like, we're beating a bit of a dead horse because once they're down 14, they're probably losing the game anyway. But, like, do it. Then, then do it. Like, have the gall to actually go out there and the courage to go out there and and say like you know what I messed up uh Carson or at the very least it's not Carson's day do it and make the switch and I, I think it's stuff like that where you know we talk about who's trying to prove what so much of this really is about Ron wanting to prove that the Carson decision was the right one and I think that at halftime in a different situation, maybe this is the difference between like, if we were making that decision where we wouldn't have pigeonholed ourselves all year and being like Carson, 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 and, and being so dramatic about it, 
that by halftime, when he's got 60 yards, I might have considered making a switch. Yeah. Because it, and and that's the thing is like there was no way, and and I also have a little bit of empathy here in the decision maker because you're going okay well maybe he got the rust out they just gone on that long drive but he comes out and he does the same stuff all over again and like maybe that's the thing where you know it's the same situation as a couple of weeks ago the second giants game where ron almost pulled the uh pulled uh the pin on taylor in the second half um i think that's what it was uh, a couple of weeks ago from Uh thinking of the right game Yeah. yeah and then he comes out in the second half and like puts enough together to to keep the the giant the job um yeah and like I probably would have looked at it that way. Carson comes out, he's bad, unlike Taylor who put a drive together. And I would have probably made the switch there because it's pretty clear Carson and this offense are a bad fit. And now, depending on what happens tonight, which we'll get to in a moment, like who knows? Maybe we'll see Sam Howell next week after all. Yeah, I guess that's a great point. You know, like because this is this could be it. And it was it was it was just a, it was a tough offensive performance to watch, and it's been a tough offensive performance for the last five weeks. I don't know how yeah. long, Greg. Yeah, you know. Well, so, at least five weeks. Yeah, I mean, I'd say the New York, the first New York game was okay. But, you know, New York 2, not great. San Fran, not great. This game, not great. So at least three weeks, not great. And yeah. for them not to be scoring points the way they're not scoring, and, like, that that needs to be fixed. If the team wants to be anything, wants to go anywhere, it needs to be fixed. And, you know, we do a lot of, uh, you know, you know, we talk a lot about uh, deficiencies in personnel uh, with regards to Scott and excuses that he could potentially make moving forward. But then you look at the New York Giants and that roster offensively is not quite as good, right? You look at some of what San Fran's been able to do with uh, Purdy at quarterback. And I know Purdy is a player who um, is surrounded by a ton of talent, one of the best defenses in the NFL. But I do look at it and say, man, they could probably be getting more out of this roster offensively. And I think ultimately that answers a lot of questions about where you think this group is at at the moment. And uh, I will say there's one benefit. If there's one benefit to this, I think it shows you where you're at headed into the offseason. I think that's really important. And I think that's very, very valuable because now you can start thinking financially about uh, what you need to do to get a quarterback in here, someone that can you can build around, you know, where you're positioned in the draft, if you can draft a guy, like all those things, all those decisions now are, I think they're laid out for you. I don't think there's any question about that anymore. Do you? No. Like Carson's not coming back, right? Done. So, so, like, so in some ways, in it, some ways, this decision is what I'm saying. It's it's yeah. valuable just for that because now instead of us right. saying, "Well, you have the Carson clarity. this," now it's like, "Well, you know, we gave him a shot. He gave it a look. He might play again next week, but I don't think he's going to show anything drastically different than what he's shown every start he's had this year." And um, and that right. to me, even as, if he as, did, as, like, who cares? It's one start. Yeah, yeah. And, like, and like, let's see, he goes out and throws for 400 yards next week. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, to me that's that's extremely valuable. If I'm Ron, if I'm one of the Martys, any of the Martys, I say, you know, we, we have our answer and we need to start making decisions about this roster uh, based on quarterback. And I, so so in some ways that's why this is valuable. I also think if you're, um, if you're Ron, you see how valuable having Allen and Payne together on the same roster is for you. You know, the second Allen goes out, like the, the dynamic elements of that defensive line change pretty dramatically. So, you know, you see how – you know, two good edge players are on the field and Payne, but really it's Alan Payne and everybody else that have been driving this show. So that, that's another good piece of information in terms of contracts, in terms of draft capital you're going to think about allocating. So all, all good, all yeah. good. While, while this stings really bad, and it should sting bad, because this is a bad loss. Um, and, I, and I also want to say, I don't think Cleveland is as bad as like the national media wants to say. I mean, they are essentially Washington. We're a half game right. better than them. They're seven. Right. They're seven and nine now on the year, and that's with most of the year with Jacoby Brissett. Right, and so you say, oh, okay, well, I, I don't. Uh, people were like, oh, we're going to kill this team. Like, no, like that's a team that we were going to have a hard time beating anyway, and we didn't come out with our best effort. And this is the result. At least we get some good data out of it for building for twenty twenty three. So here's the other thing Rivera said that is making waves right now. To clarify, you said you would talk about quarterback next week. If you guys are eliminated today by what happens at 4 o'clock, is Sam Howell in consideration? We can be eliminated. Yeah, if the Packers beat the Vikings, oh, then you guys are eliminated. How big of a deal is that? Like, he's a head I mean, coach, and, like, there's all this, there's all the like, my initial thought was, and typically when, like, media gets outraged about stuff, I try to put myself in the shoes of, the people involved and say like, okay, is this actually yeah. a big deal? Or is this an, is this an easy way to, 
to punch down or punch at, punch up, whatever you want to look at it as, at the head coach. And my initial reaction on that was, they're trying to win the football game. If they win, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and kind of get that. But like Ron Rivera is the head coach that runs things like a CEO. Like his job is to kind of look at the bigger picture and understand that and know it. And also like, how does that affect your urgency during the game? You know, and considering yeah. his big decision is the quarterback one and whether or not he pulls Wentz or stays with Heineke or what he does going into this week and how he manages this game from that position, I actually think it's a huge deal. I actually, well, I initially was like, I don't know, man. Like it's an easy, easy pot shot at Rivera. The more I think about it, the more I'm like, okay, well, if you don't know that, then like, what are you doing, man? Like, what are you doing yeah. as the head coach? And from an urgency quarterback standpoint, that would probably affect the decision if you think you have another week. And uh, not knowing that is kind of a big deal. I mean, it is a big deal, but man, like, excuse my language. I, I, I was on teams where I didn't know anything about the playoff picture. I had no idea. The team had no idea. It was like, we just got to win this next game. And I do think that fans and the, and the media do a much better job of kind of being dialed in on the scenarios and the opportunities. Cause like your, your work week in the NFL is so rhythmic, right? So it's like, Hey, it's Monday. We're doing this. It's Tuesday. We're doing this. And oftentimes you don't change your approach. And for me, like as a player, and I'm sure Ron has some similarities as a coach and even a good coach, like, I don't care about that. I care about beating the Cincinnati, uh, you know, the Cleveland Browns. Like that's the main, that is the only focus. So for him not to know, I don't really care because there's a million different scenarios. You know what I mean? Like, and obviously we know, cause we covered the team. We talked about it this morning. Like, if these three teams lose, then and we lose, then or three, three whatever the I don't even know the scenario. We talked about it like four hours ago, so I, I just look at that and I say I don't really care about that. I know he probably shouldn't have asked. Like, oh, we can get a limited day. You know what I mean? Like that should have been his immediate follow up. But it doesn't surprise me in the least that he doesn't know. And I don't care that he doesn't know. As a player, I don't care. As a former player, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. I know, I know, I know I mean, a lot I of people do, and I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not trivializing your kind of outrage or anybody's outrage about this, but there are other. Yeah, things I don't know whether it's pressure. outrage. It's just like, hey, man, if you're going to be the the CEO type and it, and exist up here above the details, you're not going to be Kyle Shanahan or Sean McVay, where your value is like you're also the OC. Like, eventually, at some point, you can't. You got to be more than like a a babysitter, and like yeah. even if you're the babysitter, knowing the situation you're babysitting is kind of an important thing. And like, yeah. so I think specifically for a Ron Rivera type of head coach, someone who kind of exists on a higher plane, like understanding that is kind of your part of the gig. Um, I get it. I get what you're saying. And I don't think it's probably as big of a deal as a lot of people. Like there's some people that are gonna be like, that's a fireable offense. It's like, nah, it really does. I don't know how much it affects anything, but like, if I told Ron Rivera in the middle of the third quarter, hey man, you could be eliminated today if you don't win this game. Does it does yeah. it give him the little extra bit of courage to go to Taylor Heineke? Maybe. And so it's not Maybe. nothing to me. It's not um, nothing. But it's no, also not, it's not like the end of the world. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, I agree. I think it is relevant. What is the, what's Ron saying? It is interesting, but not, but I think it is important. Yeah. It's yeah. like, uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. I whatever. I don't, I don't really care about that. Like personally, I think it's like they had an opportunity to win. They should have won this game. They could have, won, maybe not should, but they could have definitely won this game and they didn't put their best foot forward. And that is maybe the decision to start Carson, but we both said we would have made the same decision. Um, I think that a lot of that has to do with Scott, just kind of a departure from things that have made the offense successful and viable defensively. I felt like they, you know, Cleveland did a good job with their game plan, switching up the runs. And so to me, those things, are more significant um, than that. But maybe you're right. Maybe he says, hey, Nikki, pop in there a third quarter. Let's see if we can make something happen. Uh, I don't know. I just felt like, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. I, I just, it, it's, I'm frustrated generally about the game. I don't know if that adds to my frustration at all. Yeah. Um, as for the defensive side of it, uh, obviously Allen's injury plays a huge role. Um, to you, is that like the the absolute turning point in the game on that side of the ball um, where all of a sudden Cleveland was able to figure it out because Allen is not in there because that interior pressure and run defense is not the same or did did the game just kind of evolve and also, you know, defense gets tired because the offense is, is not sustaining drives and uh, really giving them any hope or signs of life? 
Yeah, I think I think it's probably a mix of everything. I think there wasn't like you know they had some big runs when John was in there, and I think a little yeah. bit of it is like like we said the ski. So just just moving the running back around like that does affect the timing of the run, and it affects how quickly you can get off blocks. And this is something that they haven't. I was just thinking about it. They haven't seen that a lot this year. This style of run. So like if I'm in a three technique, so I'm on the outside shoulder of the guard, which is where John normally plays. Usually you're kind of playing that shoulder and it's taking you to the run. Here they're blocking down with the tackle, right? And they play a six technique, so the tight end blocks down on the six and they pull people around. And it's just something that they haven't seen a ton this year. And it's they, they've seen it on the inside, right, like on a power, but they haven't seen it attacking the perimeter the way the Cleveland Browns did today. And I think that was a big element, right? They were Not only were they building a wall at your three technique at John Allen, but they are also getting blockers to the perimeter in a way that, you've struggled with you've struggled defending runs to the perimeter and you've given the tackle an easy down block on the three technique. So making it really challenging for him to make plays. So I think that that to me was the, the bigger factor is that they just, they identified a, a, an issue uh, defensively. They said, how do we best attack it? Let's use this something we're really good at. Let's modify how we get the back there. We're really good at that too. And I think that to me is the bigger difference in the run game while they were effective. Obviously I'll know better uh, later in the week when I watch the film, but I think that was a part of it. I think the other big thing is if you look at it, it was the big plays again, right? Fuller misses that tackle. Yeah. And I do think despite the running game being pretty effective for Cleveland, it wasn't the running game that killed you. They always it got bogged down twice in the red zone. And then it was the passing game that kind of came to life down there and they became chunk plays, right? So I think that was the thing, even though the run game was working well, when they had to kind of batten down the hatches, they were able to. And then it was the pass coverage in the back end. It looked like there was probably two coverage busts and a missed tackle. That's three plays right there uh, that led to led to points, led to led to twenty one points. So I think those those issues were bigger. And again, we talked about that on the pregame show. That's what you get when Cam Curl's not in the lineup. That's what you get when you move some pieces around when Benjamin St. Juice isn't playing. And I think uh, Johnson had an excellent game, but I do think there's just a communication element that is there with those starters. It isn't necessarily there when you bring the backups in. So I think that's what leads to some of these these er these mistakes and people just get dropped in coverage. Like the Donovan Peoples-Jones one, that's a drop coverage. The uh, Mario Cooper, that's a drop coverage. And then you miss the tackle by Kendall Fuller in a man situation. 21 points yeah. just right there. Three. Uh, Chubb, 14 for 104. It's a 7.4 average. Um, he was obviously over said 10 for a while. Yeah, a lot of those are because he has massive chunks mixed with, you know, a loss of one, massive chunk, loss of one. Um, so a little bit all over the place on that. And then Cooper, four targets, three catches, two touchdowns. Yeah. Yikes, man. 105 on the day for him. And that was the thing is like the first touchdown to Cooper, um, Adam said it during the broadcast. He's like, that's the first target for a wide receiver, first catch for a wide receiver all day is yeah. that touchdown. Um, and it's just, you know, they found some, they found some stuff and were able to exploit it. Washington couldn't do that on the other side. I mean, I'm excited, excited to, I don't know, is the best word. I am so interested to watch this or when you watch this tape of this offense, it just felt yeah. of Washington's offense. It felt so out of rhythm. It felt like it was hunting and pecking, um, all day. It just didn't have any semblance of cohesion. And um, I'm curious what that ultimately yeah. gets attributed to uh, when we watch it back. That'll be Wednesday's pod. Um, depending on what happens in these games later and everything else, uh, Logan might pop on the show live tomorrow as well, the Hoffman Show, which starts at 3 o'clock. We'll certainly have more thoughts there based off the results of the day and where this team goes moving forward. Anything else you wanted to hit uh, real quick on this edition of the podcast before we get up on out of here? Nope. I mean, uh, very frustrating, obviously. Um, yeah. But uh, happy New Year to everyone. I know this is happy how you New Year. To bring it in, but here's 2023, and uh, hopefully they get a win versus Dallas, even though it might not mean anything. Yeah, uh, or don't, or don't. If you're eliminated, just help your draft position. I'm just, I don't care. Okay. Uh, I I'll, all I will say is this: if they are eliminated next week and Howell doesn't play, that's silly. That would be, yeah, that would That'd be, be very, a wacky, very wacky dumb. bit. Uh, so we will see about that. All right. Uh, for Logan, I'm Craig. I'll see y'all tomorrow on the radio. This has been Take Command. Ay, ay, ay. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't, you, why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good, and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. 
We do. 1067, the fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do do what Logan said. Do it. Very, very smart.